All right. Uh, let's uh, <clears throat> start with the next section. Uh, second order design. Right. Uh, now, where does this uh, fit into? The last section, where we, uh, we understood how the poles are related to the gain. So when you set the gain, you get the poles to different, different locations, right? Now, how do we know what are the locations we actually need the poles be located? <clears throat> so if we know that, we can set the gain according, right? There's no problem. So therefore, there's one question still remain unanswered. That is, how do I know uh, what are these uh, desired poles I want to have in the system? Okay. So, uh, the most uh, suitable places for the pole, or poles rather, Right, uh, will make the system tuned to a particular uh, dynamic behavior so that whenever you change your reference signals, right, whatever the reference signal may be, the response will follow the reference in the most desirable way. So, uh, Designing a feedback loop or tuning a feedback loop essentially does that. It clamps uh, the poles at certain locations. So once it is located, uh, you can have any reference signal and you can change the reference signal time to time. And the, re uh, the response will follow the reference uh, pretty closely right, according to a certain uh, uh, pattern, right. And in order to bring the poles to those locations, you use the gain by adjusting the gain. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the question which is remaining unanswered is that, how do I know, so what are these poles, okay, the locations? Now, how do I know whether uh, a response is desirable or not? Now, can somebody answer me, please? So you, you have a feedback control system and then you have the reference and you set the reference, you change it and you see the response changing. How do you judge whether this response is okay or not? acceptable, can be improved, satisfactory, good, perfect, like that. How do you judge? Any answers, please? I think you, you can attempt, right? Now we are about five uh, lectures down in the course. So, you know, generally uh, what we're dealing with. So if you look at a response, right? How do you judge whether the response is good or bad, perfect or satisfactory? What are the uh, general uh, um, indices? <clears throat> no idea? Like how long it will take to come to the stable okay, condition? Okay, that's one answer, yeah. Whether the system is uh, slow or fast. If it takes too long to reach the set point reference, it's not good generally, right? Yes. Any other things? Oscillating on. Oh, yeah. If it is oscillates too much, 
beyond what we can accept, then again, it is not good. If there are no significant oscillations, it's usually acceptable. Yeah, like that. So there you are. <clears throat> so the, the, the previous answer, if it takes too long, uh, it's not good. There's a word for that. That is called the settling time. Settling time. If you give a reference to a plant and you get a response for that, the response is uh, changing for some time and after that it settles. So uh, when it settles, uh, there's no much change after that, right? Uh, so the time it takes to for the response to settle is called uh, settling time. So settling time, if it is too long, is not good. And you said oscillation. Uh, there's another word for that we call overshoot. Okay, overshoot. So you have a certain reference and the response goes beyond that. Overshoot because of the oscillations, right? And it hits some point and come back. So the big point it hits is, is called the peak overshoot. So the peak, if the peak overshoot is too much, let's say 5% of the set value or 10% of the set value, then generally it's not good. Like that, there are some uh, parameters to define, to be used to actually qualify the uh, response. Two of these things are settling time and the peak overshoot. Now, if there's a way for us to connect this peak overshoot or the settling time, basically the parameters that we use to qualify a response uh, to poles, I think problem is solved, right? If we can do that, what? Try to relate the poles to overshoot and settling time. Okay, then the problem is solved. So then what we do is that if you look at the entire design workflow, we say, okay, my, I want a response to have uh, less than 5% overshoot or uh, uh, less than uh, three second settling time. Then using this whatever te technique that we are going to develop, I determine the locations for the poles. When I do that, fruit locus will tell me what is the gain I need to set to achieve, to locate the poles on you know, those locations. Then I go to the system and tune the gain to that value. I'm done. Okay. But it is easier said than done. This technique I just uh, explained to you can only be done for second order systems. Anything beyond that is a bit complicated. So that is why second order design is the next topic. Okay, now you see uh, how elegantly these uh, contents are lined up so that uh, teaching is basically like storytelling, right? Storytelling. It is connected to the past and also to the future. Uh, so I always say the integrity is very important. Everything you learn is connected to the rest of the system, right? So that is why we use the second order system because it it helps you uh, determine a relationship between the parameters that we use to qualify a response, good or bad, right? satisfactory, unsatisfactory, whatever it is, to the closed loop poles. So that you can bring that to the root locus and calculate your gain. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Let me show you uh, what is called generic second order system. Generic second order system. We do not stick to any particular system when we develop theory, right? You know that. Let it be a shock absorber, let it be something else, right? Those are specific cases. But when we develop theory, we use something abstract. So the second order system, abstract generic system is this omega n square over s square plus 2 z to omega n s plus omega n square, right? Second order system. And in front of that, there can be a gain. There can be a gain, okay? For, for, this is valid for any second order system. 
there uh, this omega n is called natural undamped frequency later you will understand why it is called that way natural undamped frequency because any, any system right there is some sort of oscillation it's possible right then you know, when you say oscillation there's a frequency some of these oscillations uh, continue forever right and most of the times the oscillations decay or die out then it is a damped oscillation right uh, so however there is a oscillatory thing right if you look at um response it goes up and down up and down so that is this frequency you see omega n not exactly omega n maybe some uh, altered version of omega n right based on how much friction is there to take the energy away from this oscillation right and also there is this uh, damping that is basically friction c uh, uh, zeta is there to zeta omega n the zeta tells something about damping right the uh, resistance to motion the speed uh, that is zeta so this zeta and omega very much like you can say spring and the damper right combination so when i say uh, spring and damper sometimes people uh, get stuck in the mechanical systems shock absorbers and things like that no they they, they are not physical springs or physical dampers um it is the phenomena physical phenomena spring action can come without any spring okay damping action can come without any damper in the system okay so uh, therefore when you learn it don't get stick to any particular specific system so uh, the way we write generic second order system the transfer function is as i said omega n square over square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n square okay now if you know the components of the plant you are dealing with you can calculate omega n and zeta example uh, look at the second order system the uh, height adjustable stabilized platform this one all right we we spend some time on this and we derive the closed loop transfer function all right it was like this i don't want to explain this again you can go back to the notes and figure that out right so it is gs over 1 plus kgs you can see the closed loop transfer function over here gs over 1 plus kgs so when you simplify it becomes like this right so there you can see eta is 1 over m Uh, the sigma is b over 2m and rho is k over m so this is why is so r is okay closed loop transfer function now <clears throat> there you can see when you arrange it to this format when you arrange it to this format this simple k which is spring constant plus capital k this is uh, In, in in fact in this case it is the forward uh, feedback gain here right this k and this k are different so this is uh, probably a misleading thing right this is to say that any system can be uh, represented by generic second order plan plus again that is what it says because originally when you write down your equations you don't get generic second order plan then you have to break it down to generic part and a forward gain like that so here you can clear is clearly see it this is the plant right we are not actually heading for any generic uh, second order plant we are just writing equations to figure out what it is so when you do that it naturally turns out right to be a generic plant plus a gain so this k over here is actually this 1 over simple k plus capital k here and uh, the generic part appears here so there you can see simple k plus capital k over m is actually omega n square 
So this system has natural undamped frequency, which is given by this. So if you know the spring constant, if you know the feedback gain, divide by m is the natural undamped frequency in radians per second. And if you look at the denominator, you can see B over M. The, the, the uh, uh, damper coefficient over the mass, which is 2 zeta omega N. There, you, because you know zeta omega N, you can calculate zeta. Right? And that is the uh, damper damping ratio. Right? So there are two things here. Spring is connected to, related to rather omega n. It is pretty obvious to understand because the oscillatory behavior and the natural undamped frequency. Second thing is not that clear, right? That is basically the damper is related to damping ratio here. So this is the damper coefficient. This is the damping ratio. Okay. Zeta and B. Can be a bit confusing, right? This damping ratio has no units. It's just a ratio. It's a number, right? Whereas this B has units. Damper coefficient. Okay. How many newtons in a uh, physical system, mechanical system, how many newtons per uh, unit speed, okay? And then what comes over here is the gain. In fact, the DC gain. Right. So why we call this generic second order system in the first place? That is because if you look at this generic second order system, right? right when you set S to zero, it becomes one unity. When you set S to zero, this becomes unity one. So second order systems are not uh, by default or in, in most cases, uh, unity DC gain. They have different DC gains. But when you say generic second order system, it is a second order system with a unity DC gain. So if you have a non-unity DC gain, this is the only way you can uh, represent it using a generic second order system. You have the generic system and in front of that a gain, which is the DC gain of the plant. Okay, so much for that. Um, <clears throat> now, this is very important illustration here, right? Again, uh, I use the shock absorber or rather height adjustable stabilized platform, right? There you have system parameters MKB, mass, spring, and the damper. And when you combine these parameters together, in this way, you get omega N. Simple K plus capital K over M, this is omega N. And B over square root, this one, zeta, ramping ratio, okay? Now you know how they are related. So here you can see what I uh, just explained. If you look at the generic part of the plant, if you calculate the DC gain of the generic plant, plant only using the uh, final value theorem as limit uh, of S goes to zero, S G S, answer is one, okay? Right. So that's about it. Now coming back to uh, the main discussion, right? Uh, our final destination in this section is uh, try to figure out uh, some relationship between the, uh, the parameters that we use to qualify uh, the response, right? Uh, uh, and uh, the poles of the plant. So this relationship is the final uh, target of this uh, discussion. So we start off with the, uh, uh, the characteristic equation of the generic plant, 
that is s square plus 2c to omega n s plus omega n square equals 0. And uh, of a second order system like this, the, the, the poles are s1, s2 minus theta omega n plus or minus omega n square root theta square minus 1, right? So these are the poles. Now, uh, uh, if we uh, look at the uh, the uh, the possibilities for these poles, right? Uh, now, uh, as theta changes, as theta changes, damping ratio, right? You can get five different responses for different theta different theta. Remember earlier we discussed this uh, using spring and the damper but now combined together we call it theta damping ratio. There's something called damping ratio of a system. If a mechanical system it is spring and the damper together physically you can identify bigger damper or weak spring or the other way around. Now, for systems where you don't have physical springs, physical dampers, right? Uh, it is the characteristic of the plant that is zeta, right? So, so this zeta, if it is greater than one, if this is greater than one, the answer is actually two distinct real poles. So distinct pair of real negative poles, right, is the answer. So we know in that situation, system is overdamped, it's slow, it doesn't have oscillations. We know it. We discussed this earlier using uh, not, not very generic uh, example, which is spring and the damper. But now this is much more generic uh, and abstract, theta. Now, if theta is one, one square is one, this becomes zero. Uh, the whole thing is zero here. Therefore, it is both poles are on top of each other, zeta omega n. But because zeta is here, zeta is one, this is exactly minus omega n. So you have both poles at minus omega n on the real axis. Even though omega n is basically the un natural undamped frequency, now this is the value of the poles, right, on the real axis. The system is critically damped. It's the fastest non-oscillatory response. If theta is between 0 and 1, 0 and 1, interesting, is, is lower than 1, or oh, less than one, right? Then this becomes a complex number, right? So then you can uh, say that this is theta square minus one, you can write uh, as, as this. So this part you can write as uh, uh, one minus theta square, Right, and uh, square root minus one. You can write it like that, right? In in this third case, third case, right? A uh, third case. Uh, so then minus one square root is actually j. You can write it j square root one minus theta square. Right. So you have uh, a pair of complex conjugate poles when theta is between zero and one. This is the most interesting scenario. Uh, when theta is zero, what happens? So we are bringing theta from big values to uh, zero and then to the negative values, right? Uh, when theta is zero, you can see uh, the real part is zero. This part is zero. So then there's 
no real part of the poles. This is simply minus one square root. Then it is j omega n, right? Uh, plus or minus. So then the poles are on the uh, imaginary axis, exactly on the imaginary axis, two of them. One is plus j omega n, the other one is minus j omega n. Okay. So this one, number five, right? Number five, you, you get uh, two poles. One is over here. The other one is over there, right? On the real axis, uh, imaginary axis rather, J omega N plus and the other one is minus. You know that this is marginally stable condition, right? You have oscillations going on. Earlier you saw a case where we call uh, rigid body dynamics when the pole is at the origin. Now it is not at the origin, but uh, on the imaginary axis, both of these poles, and there's no real part. There's no real part. So gradually you will understand the real part of the poles is actually damping. It is to decay the oscillations, negative part, okay? Negative real part. It's good to have in a system because it doesn't allow oscillations to sustain or grow. But all of a sudden, when you don't have the real part, real negative part, your oscillations will not uh, die out. It will sustain longer. Or if you have positive real part, this real part, if it becomes positive in the next case, because theta is less than zero, you are on the right half of the S plane and the oscillations grow. Uh, system is unstable. Uh, Zeta negative means it's negative friction. So, you know, friction is always good because you can walk on the ground, right? Um, it's like gravity. If you jump, you will fall back. But if you are negative gravity, what will happen? Uh, negative friction, what will happen? Systems are unstable. Okay, so Zeta less than zero means that. When Zeta less than zero, don't worry about this side. This part is positive, uh, you are unstable. Now, <clears throat> we change the discussion from spring and the damper to uh, damping ratio. Now, again, our major question, how to find out a relationship between um, the parameters that you use to qualify the response uh, and uh, the poles, okay? We figure out, we use the sec uh, third one, this one under damped uh, condition, right? Uh, this is a specific thing. Uh, most of the industrial applications and so many other applications, they uh, use maybe 80, 90% of the plants in the world are operating in this condition, zero and one for zeta, right? In between. So uh, in that case, uh, this is what we have two poles as a pair of conjugate poles, right? Real part is minus theta omega n. Imaginary part is j omega n square root one minus theta square. So this is what you see uh, most of the time in industry, right? And the two poles are like this, right? Uh, when I say omega n square root one minus theta square, the omega n is the natural undamped frequency, right? So omega n is this length actually, this arc length, uh, so the radius. So when you say uh, in addition to omega n, uh, one minus theta square coming up, you are modulating, you are changing your natural undamped frequency uh, to something else. 
and that is what you see what the system has system doesn't have the natural undamped frequency visible all the time what is visible what is there is basically damped frequency that is omega d that is omega d because um, all of the systems they have some sort of damping so therefore omega n cannot be seen uh, it's something internal uh, quantity that doesn't uh, show up uh, because of damping it, it is adjusted like this one minus theta square square root then the whole thing is called omega d okay right now if you draw if you look at the geometry here right you will you will see real part theta omega n imaginary part uh, j omega n square root one minus theta square you can calculate this angle right you can calculate this angle uh, psi uh, say for example tan psi is one minus theta square square root over theta so this entirely is uh, about theta right so if theta is zero right your poles are here if theta is zero right there's no real part poles are over here and in that case it is not omega d it is omega n right on top of the uh, on the imaginary axis and for the first time you will see omega n if you can connect an oscilloscope and figure out the oscillation you will see omega n there okay and if uh, zeta is one this is one minus one zero right this part is zero then you are right on the uh, real axis right on the real axis again right uh, omega n you cross it at omega n so omega n on the uh, uh, real part real axis or on the imaginary axis depending on theta so it is a interesting uh, situation we are in So let's look at the transfer function. Transfer function uh, is uh, in this particular case omega n square over uh, the characteristic equation, which is uh, uh, s plus theta omega n, one of these, right, uh, plus j omega d. The other one is s plus theta omega n minus j omega d, like that. Okay, so now you have to simplify this. Then this is uh, the, you can rewrite this as s plus c to omega and whole thing square plus omega d square, right? And then uh, you connect it uh, into this format omega d. Uh, you keep it there and get another omega d over here and take omega n square to the front. So there you can see this part becomes the gain dc gain. This is the generic second order. Uh, in, in fact, uh, DC gain unity system, right? Fine. So, uh, uh, all right. So, now, uh, this transfer function, right? Uh, uh, if you want to get the unit step of the transfer function, this one, right? Now you introduce a input to the transfer function. Let's say one over s is the unit step. Then you get the response. This is the unit step response of the plant, generic second order plant. uh so we did this some time back right uh this is the uh this is in the laplace table as sine omega d if you look at sine it's laplace transform you will see this one but instead of uh, s you have s plus c to omega n so therefore it should be exponentially scaled like this e to the minus e to omega n t right and integrate because one of s one over s okay so we did 
this some time back. Uh, so when you integrate this, you, you see appendix B for the integration. If you can't do it yourself, the answer is this. It takes uh, about 10 minutes uh, to derive this one. It is uh, one page, some uh, 12, 15 lines, right? Look at the appendix B, you will get the result like this. So this is Laplace domain, this is time domain, okay? It's time domain. Now, because omega d, the damped uh, frequency is equal to omega n one minus theta square square root, this one, right? You can replace uh, um, some of these terms here. You can replace some of these terms here. You can see omega n square or omega d, right? Uh, this part, you can change omega d square is equal to this one, omega n square one minus theta square then it becomes omega n square right this part changes and here also omega d is replaced with omega n one minus theta square square root then it becomes like this so finally this is the result so we have got it earlier uh, step response of a generic second order plan now this straightforward relationship, this one in the outside world is the spring like this. There's a mass. You can see these graphics here, right? If you give it a push, it will settle at some point of time like that. So the, the motion, if you, look, if you plot the motion, you will see this oscillation and final settling at some point. Okay. Right, so uh, okay. Uh, right, so there you can see the response uh, now, right, uh, is determined by zeta damping ratio and omega d omega d okay and also this uh, phase angle phi is given by omega d over z to omega n in this derivation you can find it which is one minus theta square over theta so which means uh, 1 minus theta square, which is this one, over theta. So this height over this length. So that is the tangent of phi, right? So this angle, this angle. So if this angle is big, you get more oscillation. If this angle is small, you get less oscillation. Okay? Right. Right. Now let's uh, let's use this equation, uh, the step or uh, unit step response of the generic second order plan, right? Uh, using this equation, you can derive uh, uh, rise time, peak time, settling time peak overshoot, all these things that we discussed earlier, just a while ago, that as the parameters to qualify a response. These parameters can be derived using this equation. That is why it is so important. How? So as you know, this uh, uh, response, right, uh, goes like this and finally settles, right? So this is the peak point, this is the peak point. So at, at what time, right, uh, we get to that point, which is called the TP, right? Uh, the peak time. So if you want to calculate that one, you need to differentiate the response. You need to differentiate the response, right? 
so this is the equation you differentiate this i don't want to go into details i'm just guiding you right when you differentiate this is a differentiation of a ratio uh, you have the numerator denominator right uh, you do that then uh, you get to this equation omega n over 1 minus theta square square root e to the minus theta omega n t sin omega dt this is the rate of change rate of change so uh, so when you reach the peak here the rate of change is zero so you have to set this to zero So these are all positive numbers. If you want to set the whole thing to zero, it has to be sine omega dt zero. So when sine omega dt uh, is zero, we, we say t as tp. tp makes this whole thing zero. So you can calculate tp as this. Pretty clear. Okay, so if you know you zeta, you know your TP, peak time. So that gives you some, some indication, right? Or the other way around. If you want to have some TP, you can calculate, okay, what is the zeta I need? If you know zeta, you know part of the poles. So see how these thing, things are connected, right? The poles are in Laplace domain. TP is in time domain. So we are taking now time, time domain parameters and connect it to uh, Laplace domain poles, okay? So once you know the poles, you can calculate the feedback gain and set it there. So that is how, how the, the, the process is designed. So this is one of the very important equations, right? There are a few more to come. Uh, how the uh, omega n and uh, uh, zeta are connected to peak time. Second, rise time and overshoot. Rise time means uh, when the uh, response rises, right, from here to here. So uh, it is basically rule, rule of thumb, right, not a highly analytical uh, thing, right. Uh, if you look at this whole uh, thing, right, you, you take about uh, somewhere here, right, to somewhere here. Because uh, after that, it takes a lot of time, but there's no significant improvement. And here is also the same. You take uh, some, some time to get going. So this part is more like, uh, like linear, right? Uh, I would say like this. So therefore, we call the time from here to here uh, as the rise time, so TR, TR, right, from here to here. That is the rise time between 10% to 90%, okay? 10% to 90% of the first peak of the response, first peak of the response, right? Uh, there we generally assume this is not very accurate but for industries you need to have some uh, um, convenient methods for the engineers to tune systems and all uh, they're not visual researchers so therefore we assume right something in between zero and one that is 0.5 and calculate your rise time to be uh, 3.6 over omega n so this is basically coming from uh, this one this equation okay for uh, theta uh, 0.5 and in that case uh, psi is 50 56.3 degrees right so uh, this is a uh, just a uh, indication of how fast the response is okay What's happening? Someone annotated it.
maybe uh, his little daughter or son would have done it. Huh? <laughs> Uh, we want to get rid of this. I don't know who is uh, notating. Hold you to my phone, sir. Extremely sorry for that, sir. I'll I'll try to fix it. All right. Okay. I don't get the eraser somehow. So while he's trying to get rid of that, uh, now, now if you look at this equation, right, uh, this one, uh, this one, uh, you can substitute uh, uh, your zeta, right, your zeta, uh, and uh, if you already know omega n, right, uh, you can actually completely draw it, okay, because psi and all these things uh, are known when you know omega n and zeta. Then for reasonable values, you can actually uh, calculate your uh, price time, uh, assuming 10 to 90 percent of the first p, okay. But this is not a very hard and fast, uh, very elegant mathematical approach. Basically, a uh, uh, rule of thumb kind of thing. So, uh, then uh, at the first peak, at the first peak, uh, first peak first peak is also the maximum overshoot point isn't it right when you get to the first peak over here it is the maximum overshoot point as well so if you know peak time you can simply substitute that into the response equation and it will be equal to one plus peak overshoot one is here this is the overshoot, P overshoot, one plus P. You can write it like that. Okay. So what we do is we get TP, which is this one, and substitute it to this equation for TP. Right? And the answer is one plus P O. So if you look at uh, this substitution, 1 minus this whole thing, uh, e to the minus e to omega and tp sine omega dtp plus phi is equal 1 plus p o, right? 1 plus p o. Now you substitute for tp. In fact, you don't have to just substitute for tp, but what you have here is omega n tp, omega n tp. So if you look at uh, uh, this equation, right? Rather than substitute for TP, you can substitute omega and TP, both these things together. The answer is pi over 1 minus theta square square root. So when you do that, it becomes like this. And also omega DTP is equal to pi. Right? This is again overshoot point. 
right? And sine phi plus phi is actually minus sine phi because phi, you know, it's coming from theta and uh, 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 the phase plane here, right? It's coming from this plane here, right? So what is sine? Sine means uh, this one over omega n. So omega n one minus theta square square root over omega n. What is it? One minus theta square square root, right? So like that. One minus theta square square root. So then it becomes like this, right? It becomes like this. Then some of these things cancel out. It is e to the minus theta pi over one minus theta square is equal to PO, right? Uh, then uh, this becomes natural log of PO. This e to the minus thing becomes uh, like this. Uh, and then uh, you can say this as, uh, uh, if you bring the pi over here, uh, natural log of PO over pi, it is zeta over square root one minus zeta square. So what is that? If you look at this uh, geometry here, over here, right? Zeta over one minus zeta square. So you can say this is zeta, this length is zeta over this length, one minus zeta square. So then it is this angle tan this angle, let's call it beta, right? Let's call it beta, uh, this angle, let's call it beta, right? Tan beta. Right? Tan beta. Uh, is equal to natural log of P over P power should over pi. There you get an, uh, uh, equation for beta, tan inverse this one. So which means, uh, <clears throat> which means uh, you, you know how the overshoot is related to this angle. That's what you know. Okay. You know how overshoot is related to this angle. Uh, if this angle is smaller, you have more overshoot. If this angle is bigger, you have less overshoot. Now you can calculate what, what overshoot you want. Let's say 5%, 10% or whatever, right? So more than one, if you have 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, it's the percentage overshoot, right? It's a percentage overshoot. So you can put it over there and calculate beta and say, I want to have my poles, right? Uh, within this area to have lower overshoot than whatever percentage. Clear? So let's say you want, you can have 10% overshoot. You can calculate beta and draw this line and say that, okay, have your poles along this line or below the line. On the line, you have 10% overshoot. Below the line, less than 10% overshoot. Above the line, more than 10% overshoot. So you, you figure out where to stay, where to place your poles in, in order to achieve the overshoot condition. So overshoot is a qualifying parameter of a response, right? So isn't, isn't this interesting? So earlier you saw the rise time, the peak time, right? Now overshoot, things like that. Now we are connecting those things into the uh, pole plane, into the pole plane. Now you say, okay, you draw a line like this and say, this is the 10% overshoot line, right? So then we have to, find out a way to place the poles uh, less than 10% overshoot and or exactly 10% overshoot, whatever it is, on the line or below the line, okay?
What about settling time? Settling time. Settling time is uh, the time for the amplitude to drop to one percent of the initial amplitude. So when you do the oscillation, you have some initial amplitude. This is the equation y d is equal to one minus this whole thing. You have some initial amplitude, and uh, over time it decays out, reduces. Uh, when it drops to one percent, how long does it take to drop it to one percent? Take a piece of paper, right? Take a piece of paper, and this is the equation for the response. Can somebody calculate me? Get me this answer. How do I know? How do I calculate the time for the amplitude to drop to one percent of the initial amplitude? Please work that out. I'll give you about a few minutes. In about three minutes, give it a try. After that, I'll show you the results. Excuse me, sir. Your mic is muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, this is the response, and it is a uh, uh, it is a one minus exponential uh, exponential decayed uh, sinusoidal waveform, right? So this is the decaying part with some amplitude here. This is the amplitude. This is a sine t, right? So this amplitude decays gradually. There's an initial amplitude and there's a final amplitude that is 1% of the initial. So what we do is this. Uh, the initial amplitude that is A0 when time is zero, you put time zero here. When time is zero, this is e to the minus zero over one minus theta square. So that is the initial amplitude. Then at uh, the settling time, ATS, that this is the amplitude at settling time, right? E to the minus theta omega and T S over one minus theta square square root, right? This is the amplitude, which is actually 1% of this one, okay? So what we do is we put the amplitude at settling time over the initial amplitude, right? Then you can clearly see the answer is e to the minus theta omega n t s, okay? From these two, this over that, this over that. This has to be 0 0.01 because we define the settling time as the time amplitude drops down to 1% of the initial, right? So then you can calculate your TS as 4.6 over theta omega n. Now there are, if you know theta and omega n, you can calculate what is, what sort of settling time is you're gonna get uh, in the response. If it is uh, too long, you have to do something about it, right? Uh, somehow the relationship is there. Right. So again, as you know, zeta omega n, this is the real part uh, of the pole, right? Or it is some sort of combination of zeta and omega n, right, to settling time. So we can make use of these individual relationships 
or uh, inequalities or equalities, whatever it is, to figure out a criterion to locate the poles so that these poles satisfy the overshoot, the settling time, the rise time, whatever uh, specification, right? That we desire to have in the response. So when we put all these things together, this is what I, uh, this is my summary to you. Now, if, uh, if your maximum overshoot, right, is already specified, Let's say, according to the requirement, right, you can maximally afford to have 5% uh, overshoot. So then P O max is given, P O max is given, you put it to that equation and calculate your beta, right? According to that, beta has to be bigger than whatever angle you get over here for your overshoot. That is one requirement to place your poles, okay? Second thing, if you know your maximum settling time, Ts max, you put it to that equation and calculate your zeta omega n. Zeta omega n. What is zeta omega n? It's the real part of the poles. You can't uh, make it smaller than whatever value you get, right? This one. You can't make it even smaller. If you do that, uh, settling time will be more than what is specified, right? Third, if the response has to rise before maximum time of TR max, then you put it TR max there and calculate omega n. So like this, right? And you, if you draw this um, on the pole plane, you will see your feasible area to locate your poles. So this one is the beta, the first condition, right? You draw that line. It has to be bigger than this, bigger than this. So therefore, the shaded area is not good. We can focus on uh, the the. Uh, the half plane above the real axis, right? This triangle, the shaded area is not good because if you if you place your poles there, you get more than uh, the uh, uh, acceptable overshoot. And then second one is zeta omega n, right? This one, again, to the right of that is not good because if you place the poles there, you don't have uh, the required zeta omega n quantity, right? So your rise time will be more if you if you are here because slow response, when you go over here, response is slow. So it takes time to rise. And finally, uh, uh, sorry, the settling time. Uh, the maximum time, rise time comes from 3.6 over TR max and you calculate your omega n, put an arc like this, omega n, right? So you have to be away from that arc somewhere here. So eventually, when you put all these constraints together, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. And eventually, what can you do? It is in this white area, white area. And try to be uh, closer to that white area, right? Not too far away, because even though the space is open, right? Try to be, try to stay away, close to that area, right? Then you have a pretty good system. Now, what you want to do is you want to put this and the root locus together on top of each other, right? Like layers. Then you can figure out uh, where the root locus come out of the shaded area, right? And then you figure out, okay, I want to have my poles over here. Then you satisfy your rise time, your settling time, your overshoot, all of these requirements. So you have a very nice system. Right, so I think that's about it for today. But if you have any questions, please ask.
i will uh, i will upload an assignment to the moodle uh, you get a notification and you can download and submit within the week before the next class okay so that will be our first assignment i will be not giving too many assignments uh, because of the situation right uh, maybe about uh, uh, four assignments right four or five right and i will count if i give five i will count uh, four right and uh, because every year right there there's always some students not submitting assignments right and uh, i don't just want to penalize them and be very harsh on it so what i do is uh, if i give five i will count only four if i give three uh, four i will count uh, three three out of four or four out of five um, but if you submit two out of five you are definitely in trouble okay so make sure there is a flexibility and uh, concession uh, but that is limited okay right uh, if there are no questions then uh, let's call the day off and um, i will upload the videos and the powerpoint powerpoints are there in the website right uh, only videos are not there so i will upload the videos and the assignment to the site right today's powerpoints are not there sir say it again today's ones are not there the powerpoints are oh, okay okay i'll check that out uh yeah i have two sites that's why uh did you go to moodle or to my website course website the moodle you have given a link for the course website uh, professor yeah uh <laughs> professor i know this is possible uh, yeah. only if it's okay from your end we are okay with the assignment but if it's not too much trouble can we have it can uh, i i understand i understand you mentioned that you want it done for next class right can we have it like couple of days further ahead Uh, we have three exams coming uh, from other subjects as well if that's all right exams you... are mid term yeah so this week so is it possible to have it like maybe not next week oh, but okay. further ahead all Do right all right yeah i'll anyway upload the assignment and uh, deadline will be two weeks from now okay thank you professor yeah sorry for the inconvenience right. no problems right. that's okay uh so what is the other one uh, you said uh, you are downloading uh, powerpoint uh, slides the pdf of the powerpoints from uh, my course website okay so they are readily available there but you what you said is this one is not available there right yes yes instead of this uh, okay, book okay. Okay. right ah that's why i i think if you if you read the book chapter that is more than good enough all these things are there in, in the book with the detailed explanation So don't worry about this PowerPoint. If the book chapter is there, just read that one. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Then, uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, we we'll call the day off. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome.